رحمت الله و بركاته. Want to welcome everyone uh, once again, Alhamdulillah, to this uh, program that we're having titled "Forgiven," uh, where we go over the stories of forgiveness from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the lives of the companions of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, may Allah be pleased with them, and of the pious predecessors and the righteous people of the past. So. Um, inshallah, we're going to go ahead and get started. I apologize for a little bit of delay in getting started. We obviously had the Ramadan nights program as well, so just in between kind of wrapping that up and transitioning, it took a little bit uh, to get everything wrapped up. But inshallah, alhamdulillah, uh, we're here, and uh, the objective is to spend some time in the remembrance of Allah, the dhikr of Allah, in the house of Allah, on these blessed nights uh, that Allah has granted us. And so inshallah, that objective will be fulfilled. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into the program. Today, inshallah, Ustad Abdurrahman is going to start us off. And we're going to be talking about, as the subject, the theme, you know, of forgiveness and forgiven, we're going to be covering today a really fascinating incident from the life of a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the answer that he gave to a question and the lesson that he learned in the course of that. Inshallah. All right. So the story is narrated to us by Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi, and he says that it comes in a well-known text called Tanbihul Ghafilin. And he, the, the title that he gave this section <coughs> is called The Tawbah of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, an uh, uh, fatwahu fi amra'at zaniyati. That uh, in the answer he gave to the woman who committed fornication. So this is like an interesting title because when you hear about the action that was done by the person in question, not Abu Huraira, but the woman, your assumption is that the tawbah is going to be from her. But here, the tawbah is being directed towards uh, Abu Huraira and specifically about the fatwa or the answer he gave. So what's the, uh, what's the story? The story goes that Abu Huraira said that I left the uh, one night, I left a gathering after we prayed the Isha prayer with the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And I came upon a woman who looked, uh, she was standing kind of in the road and looked like she was looking for some help. And she said to me, oh Abu Huraira, that I have committed a grave sin. I have done something horrible. So she then said, do you think that there's any chance that I can be forgiven? So Abu Huraira, he answers and he says, what was the sin that you did, right? So she, she clarifies, and I'm going to try to be a little bit uh, sensitive about this language. She says that uh, I had committed zina, and I had terminated the result of the uh, act. I had, I had terminated the result of the act, okay, from the zina. So then she says, is there any tawbah for me? Is Allah ever going to forgive me? Abu Huraira radiallahu an was somebody, of course, Abdurrahman al-Masakhra al-Dawsi radiallahu an, that was his name, a legend. I mean, indisputable in terms of his contribution, specifically with hadith, specifically as a person who transmitted knowledge from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to uh, all of us, but obviously to the rest of the companions. Just absolute legend. And he says something here that, quite honestly, again, looking back on it, you can say to yourself, well, you know, that's probably not the best answer to give, but he was so just shell-shocked by, I think, the weight of what was described, that his answer was very blunt. He said, halakti wa ahlakti, that basically you are destroyed. Without a doubt, you're done. Absolutely, you're done. There's no chance that you're going to make it past this tawbah. He said, actually, there is no repentance that's going to be able to grasp and to contain the gravity of what you've done. There's none. So he said that, he, he's now telling the story, he said that the woman just kind of took that, like she took the brunt of that answer, and she just kind of went about her day, and she left, right, sort of in a daze. Like, what do you do? Someone as notable as Abu Huraira, 
who you know is a close companion of the Prophet Sallallahu one of his selected students, Ayatul Salam, you, you come to him, you open up about the, something that you've done, and he gives you this answer. So she just kind of like, almost in a daze, just kind of wandered off. Then he says, I went to my, ho- I went to my, my you know, the, the place that I was staying, and he said, فَقُلْتُ fi nafsi." I started to doubt myself. And I started to speak internally, like have these thoughts. That he said, Uftiya wa Rasulullah bayna adharina. That, did I just give an answer to somebody and the Prophet ﷺ was like, in our midst? Like, did I, did I seriously just do that? I spoke so far out of line. So, he went back and he said, فَلَمَّ asbahtu." That when I woke up, I went to the Prophet ﷺ. And I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, there was a woman who sought a fatwa from me, and you know, this is what she said. And the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, he, uh, and then Abu Huraira said, this is what she said, and this is the answer that I gave. So she told me this is the sin she committed, and this is the answer that I gave. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, anta wallahi halakta wa ahlakta. He said, you are the one that's destroyed, I swear. And then he said, have you not heard the ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he describes that as long as somebody does not call upon anybody with Allah and they do not uh, engage in any of the major sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them and in fact when they seek his forgiveness that Allah Ta'ala will reverse the sin and turn it into good deeds. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ رَحِيمًا Have you not heard that verse? He asked Abu Huraira. So Abu Huraira says, when I heard this, it was as if I got, excuse my language, slapped in the face. Like a ton of bricks just hit me in the chest. So he says, فَخَرَجْتُ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ he said, I went and I started to just, again, almost like the woman left in a daze, I frantically started searching for her. And I went to the streets and I started calling out to the people of Medina that who can point me to the woman who asked me a question yesterday? Who can point me? Who can direct me? Did anyone see where she went? And he said, of all people, there was a young person, a child, who said that, you know, uh, she's taken refuge from you, right? Like she's, she's not, you can't see her. Hatta, he said that he waited for her until the nighttime, and I was able to meet her where she was, and I told her what the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ told me. I completely corrected my, uh, my mistake, my answer, by telling the Prophet ﷺ, and he said that when I told her that, there was a, a, like an elation, like almost like a, a, such a relief that I saw from the happiness that she was experiencing. And she said at that moment that I have a garden that belongs to me. I have a hadiqah that belongs to me. And I am committing and pledging that that garden will be given, the property to the masakin as a sadaqah for this turn of events that the Prophet Sallallahu has given me. So this is the story. And I mean, Shaykh, you know, this is, again, like I said in the beginning, when you read this story, you think the Tawbah is going to be talking about the sister. May Allah be pleased with her. But then you see that the titling is reflecting that Abu Huraira is the one who has to engage in some sort of repentance for what he did. So there's obviously a lot of layers here. Shaykh, do you mind kind of giving us some of your reflections about how do we process such a story? Because I think for all of us, if we're going to be honest, if we experienced what Abu Huraira experienced in that same way, we probably at some degree would have felt that maybe there, maybe he was partially not wrong, right? I mean, this is such a horrible thing to do. But how do we then negotiate the internal battle that he went through and the answer of the Prophet Sallallahu How do we understand all of this with regards to the uh, forgiveness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Yeah, and... One of the things, if you can kind of mention, share, you had shared with me about mm. just kind of an interesting thought. Yeah. About, you know, what that reflects 
in terms of knowledge. Yeah. And Abu Huraira, if you could share that. So we were talking before the session, and as I was reading this, I had like this weird realization. Have you guys heard the hadith about the man who killed 99 people? Okay, so Abu Huraira's specialty again was what? Hadith. That was his special. I mean, he spent his, you know, not his life, but the, year, the, the handful of years he had with the Prophet ﷺ as a Muslim, he spent with the Prophet ﷺ just absorbing every hadith, every lesson he could, okay? And he becomes like this hallmark, this standard, the gold standard of what a narrator looks like. And you'll see it in so many books of hadith, you know, on Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu. You'll see that upon Abu Huraira or narrated by him. So the hadith of the man who killed 99 people, do you guys know like kind of how the story goes? He kills 99 people from, Bani, you know, he's from Bani Israel, he commits 99 murders, and then he goes and he asks a pious person, an ascetic individual who has a lot of iman, but not a lot of knowledge. And he says that, this is what I've done, can Allah forgive me? So the man says, of course not, absolutely not. And he says, you're like a monster, get away from me. So the man becomes, of course, you know, embarrassed and angry, and he kills the Zahid. He kills that guy. So now it's even 100. Then he moves on, and he feels bad again, and he goes now to the scholar, and he says to the scholar, is there any way that Allah can forgive me? I've now killed 100 people. The scholar says, yes, of course, I mean, what you've done is terrible, but Allah can forgive anything, so long as you sincerely ask. And then also, he said, you need to leave. You need to leave this town and go Maybe as a condition of tawbah, maybe as like a psychological reset, who knows, right? Could have been from their sharia or whatnot. But the point being, you need to leave. So I was telling Sheikh, I said, it's so interesting, because when you read the story of Abu Huraira, and you see kind of how it's playing out, you are starting to see shades of that other story, right? A person who did something pretty bad, really bad, comes to an individual, asks because they trust the individual's knowledge, then, then the individual initially gives an answer that is not accurate, it's incorrect. And I said the most interesting thing about this, how the parallel of the stories are, is that it's within reason to think that Abu Huraira knew that hadith. Because again, that's his specialty, that's what he spent his time doing. So you have an individual who of course has heard from the mouth of the Prophet Wasallam all of the verses of repentance, all the verses of forgiveness, and he's heard the stories of previous nations and how they were forgiven, but when the time came for he himself to be able to produce that same answer, the knowledge he had didn't quite meet you know, what, the, what the, the, the situation demanded. And so there was like this incredible, it was very humbling for me, which is that you can know everything you need to know and still make a, make a mistake. Like in a situation, you could absolutely know the right answer, and you can still mark the wrong answer on the test. And so that was like my first reflection, Sheikh, was like, this is happening to Abu Huraira, who for sure, in my mind, would have at least heard about this narration or this story from the man of Ben Israel. And for him to sit here and respond in the same way that the, the monk did is something that just blows my mind. Like, no one is safe from repeating the mistakes of the people that we've learned about. You should never ever feel like you're secure from you know, replicating. Uh, those mistakes. Yeah, and so Toba, right? The title, the theme here is forgiven, to be forgiven, to achieve and attain forgiveness. A condition for forgiveness is that you have to sincerely repent, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the repentance of those who repent to Him, right? So, but the condition or just what's necessary for a person to actually repent is that there needs to be an acknowledgement or the willingness to acknowledge that I've made a mistake, right? And in order for a person to be in a place where they can accept and admit that they've made a mistake, that they've done something wrong, there needs to be some sense some awareness of, I don't know everything. An awareness of, I have growing yet to do. I still have some learning to do. I don't know everything. I don't have everything figured out. I'm nowhere near perfect. That awareness has to be there. 
And that's illustrated in the story because again, as Ustad pointed out, this is somebody who quote unquote knows a lot. He does actually know a lot, but I'm talking about how we phrase it. Mm. Somebody who knows a lot. But you see that Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, why is he able to just so quickly adjust? Mm -hmm. Is because he is grounded with that understanding and that realization that I'm not perfect. I still have a lot to learn. I still have a lot of growing to do. That humility, that humbleness, that humility is actually the very first step. That's the first ingredient. That's the first element that needs to be present within a person. That there needs to be some level of humility. Because that humility will allow a person to say, I can make mistakes. So that when they do make a mistake, they say, okay, I was wrong here. If I was wrong here, then what do you do when you're wrong? You fix your mistake. So then he goes and he understands what is actually correct and what's not. And then he's willing to go out of his way to go and correct it. And that results in the repent. That is what we call that entire scenario, that entire exercise from A all the way to Z of being humble enough, being humble, knowing that I can make a mistake, acknowledging a mistake, go and then learning what is right and wrong, and then correcting your mistake and proclaiming I was wrong here and this is what's right and this is what's wrong. That whole exercise, that whole journey put together is called repentance. That's called repentance. That's called toba. And when a person does that, then that's where the guarantee from Allah kicks in. In Allah tawabur rahim. لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَقْبَلُ تَوْبَةَ عَنَ عِبَادِهِ That's where the guarantee from Allah comes in that Allah will accept repentance. Allah will forgive. And there's so many other, you know, kind of similar types of stories um, that illustrate the same kind of point. I wanted to mention one that's very reflective of something like this. Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu so again, Ustad started off in a very interesting place. And you know, this is what the scholars of hadith do, the shariheen, those who kind of write commentaries on hadith. When a hadith starts off, or there's an incident, or a story, or an event, or a narration, right? Whether it's Ibn Hajar, or An-Nawawi, or whoever it may be, what they do is they start off by giving you like a little bit of a background on the person in the story. Right? And they tell you about the person's accomplishments and the person's qualifications and a person, the person's accolades. Why? So that you can really truly appreciate the gravity of what you're about to learn. So that's why he mentioned about Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. Similarly, Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I mean, mentioning his accolades is impossible in a session like this, right? Entire like 600 page works have been dedicated to just discussing who he was and what he achieved and accomplished, right? But suffice it to say, and I think I, uh, you had mentioned this maybe yesterday or I heard you mentioning it somewhere in some other talk. Um, but anyways, um, Umar radiallahu ta'ala we can summarize it by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, لَوْ كَانَ نَبِيًّا بَعْدِي لَكَانَ عُمَرٌ أَنَا خَاتَمُ النَّبِيًّا لَوْ كَانَ نَبِيًّا بَعْدِي لَكَانَ عُمَرٌ That I am the finality of prophets. I am the seal of prophethood, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. But he said, had there ever even been, hypothetically, the question of a prophet who would come after me, it would be somebody in the mold of Umar. Like that's how remarkable this man is. Right? That the Prophet says there are two there are two individuals that are that in the heavens that are like my right hand and my left hand that I really you know uh, trust. And that is Jibreel wa Mikail alayhim salam, the angels, Gabriel and Michael, the archangels. And then he said, then there are two individuals on the earth, and that is Abu Bakr wa Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So just imagine what this person's level is. Where the Prophet calls him Al Farooq. You as a human being are the distinguisher between right and wrong. That when you come down walking down the road and Shaitan spots you, Shaitan changes his path. Right? So Shaitan runs from you. So that's who Umar radiallahu anhu is. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he was the Khalifa Amir al Mu'minin, he's in charge of the whole Muslim Ummah. All right? After the Prophet. He would patrol the streets of Medina at night. 
So it's late night, right? Kind of a dark night outside, like tonight. And he's walking around the streets, just patrolling, making sure everything's okay, everything's good and calm. And he comes across this, like, residence where there's some light kind of coming out. It's like, uh, you know, the house has a little open area, like a courtyard, right? And so he sees the light, there's a fire burning, there's some light coming out of there, and there's some noise, some commotion. So he's just, I hope everything's okay. So he kind of climbs up on the wall, and he looks over the wall, and he sees a man, and again, like Gustav mentioned, right? It's a family-friendly gathering, so I'm going to speak in code, all right? Um, so he looks over the wall, and he sees that there's a guy, he's sitting there, and he's, you know, partaking, consuming. Of, having a cold one. Yeah, having a cold one. All right. <laughs> He's partaking of an intoxicant. All right. Scientific talk. Right. I'm trying to hide it from the kids. Most for, of the adults for, just didn't understand what I just he's said. Had, he's, having a, <laughs> he's having a type of kombucha. It went bad. Real yeah. bad. Real south. So, and at the same time, there's a young woman there in his company who is, you know, entertaining him. So this is a bad look, to say the least. It's Medina. So Omar radiallahu looks at this over the wall, and his eyes get so big, they're about to fall out of his head. And he looks at the man, he says, Ittaqillah ya rajul. Fear God. What are you doing? He just barks at him, fear God. And the man looks back at Omar, looks up at the wall, and he says, Ittaqillah, you are invading my privacy. Because there's, it's in the Quran. Like you can't go into someone's home unless you have permission. And the Prophet ﷺ said that looking inside of someone's home is like going inside. You can't do that. So he said, Taqillah, you fear God, invading my privacy. It's my house. Who invited you in? And Umar is just kind of caught off guard and he comes down off the wall. Then he goes home. And he's just very distraught. It's a bizarre experience all around. And he's just making tawbah and, you know, reflecting and just trying to wrap his head around it and asking Allah for forgiveness and just trying to understand, like, what do you do in that kind of a situation? A week or so goes by. And the man shows up when Umar radiallahu is kind of like office hours. Like he sits and people can come talk to him and ask questions. The man shows up. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala just, this is Umar radiallahu anhu. He's not afraid of anybody. Right? But he just said that because I was so embarrassed of how I had crossed the line. He says I couldn't make eye contact with him. Like I couldn't look him in the eyes. And when the man came up and they sat down, he leaned over so nobody else could hear and he said, Brother, I want you to know that since that night, I have not said a word to anybody about what I saw. I kept it to myself. And the man leans over to Umar and he goes, and I want you to know that since that night, I have not committed those sins ever again. I made Tawbah. And it's just powerful. It's beautiful, right? You see... That, that, that character, that humility, that willingness to admit one's mistake and know when you're wrong and repent to Allah, how it can even inspire another person. And what reminded me of that was here. When Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala was wandering about, A'adu fi sikak al Madina, he said, I was just like running around, wandering aimlessly through the streets of Medina and just ask, anybody seen this woman? Anybody seen this woman? The kids started to say, Junna Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira has gone crazy. The kids are like, Abu Huraira is acting really wacky. They're like pointing at him, being like, is he crazy? And he said, because I was just beside myself. What have I done? Mm -hmm. And when he finds that woman and the, the desperation, it's like just dripping from him of wanting to correct what he had done wrong. Do you see what it inspires within that woman? 
That's what's powerful, right? So knowledge, you start talking about knowledge. Knowledge isn't just being able to quote a lot. Like Abdullah bin Mubarak rahimahullah ta'ala said, al-ilmu, right, that knowledge is what it motivates you to act upon. Knowledge is not just simply what you can quote. Right? Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala has a similar statement. So what you see here is that his true knowledge True understanding that he gained from the Prophet ﷺ, right, of being willing to admit one's mistake and repent and correct what someone has done wrong. Look what it inspired within that woman. Not only does she do tawbah, but she says that in Ali Hadiqa wa hiya sadaqatun al masakin li dhambi. I'm dedicating this huge garden, plentiful garden that just continues to produce food. You know, I, I'm dedicating it, donating it, committing it. It's an endowment where from this day on forward, it will always continue to feed the poor people of Medina. So you see how that Tawbah begets Tawbah. Humility begets humility. Right? And that's just something that really jumps out at me here because, um, you know, uh, far be it from me, I'm not from the people of knowledge, but, you know, a lot of times knowledge is kind of looked at as this like, Badge of honor, right? But you see the responsibility that comes with knowledge. How knowledge is truly powerful and transformative when it is merged and combined together with that kind of humility. Allah ta'ala. One of the things interesting, Shaykh, is, um, and I, I totally did not connect these two things until I'm just rereading this again, was that, you know, when he mentions that I, I can't believe I gave an answer in front of the Prophet mm. And he sort of, you know, he catches himself. It's already done, but he's done it. And then you see the Prophet Sallallahu you know, the ayah that he mentions, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهَنَ آخَرَ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ أَلَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ Which are the two things she did. Yeah. It's ajeeb. The Prophet Sallallahu he mentions a verse from Surah Al-Furqan in which he says that, <laughs> you know, two of the things that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentions as grave sins, are taking a life except that, tw- that which Allah has, has, has allowed to be taken, obviously in certain very extreme scenarios like you know, self-defense and whatnot, combat. combat, whatnot, and then also, and those who did not commit uh, fornication or adultery. And, and, and the woman comes to Abu Raira and she mentions that these are the things she's done. So the Prophet ﷺ mentions that verse, but then he finishes yeah, the right. passage. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيَّاتٍ حَسَنَاتٍ so Abu Huraira knew the first verse, <laughs> but he didn't continue it, right, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. And, and what does this show you? It shows you that, as, the, as Allah Ta'ala tells in the Qur'an, over every person, right, there is always someone greater in knowledge. There's always someone higher in knowledge. So Abu Huraira is somebody that this woman saw and was like, let me ask you. Sometimes if you ask... You know, and she also may have had the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the, in, in, as a chance to ask. Sometimes if you ask somebody and maybe you, know, you have a chance to ask somebody who maybe might be more qualified or know more, it's best for you to be patient and ask those who might know more because you might get an answer that's, that's not the right answer, mm. right? And there's no shame if you ask somebody who is you know, developing in their knowledge, there's no shame in that developing student to say like, I don't, I don't know, I'm not sure. Because look at the damage that can be done when a person speaks and takes the conservative route, mm. right? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, this is a horrible sin. I can't ever imagine Allah forgiving this. I mean, you don't want people standing on the corner and being like, you know what, commit all the sins you want. You're good, right? I'll answer for you on the day of judgment. Just come find me, right? You don't want that kind of leniency. So this person, Abu Huraya, takes a conservative answer, you know, playing it safe, so to speak, in the, in the game of fatwa, right? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a conservative answer. And the Prophet Sallallahu his response is of just utter shock. He literally says, like, where, where are you coming from? Like, where, where did this come from? Almost like, I thought you knew better. And then he mentions the verse Abu Huraira for sure has heard numerous times. But he finishes the passage. So, two lessons. Number one is, if you need help, make sure that you seek qualified answers. And number two is that if you're in the horrible position of having to give answers at any level, and all of you will be at some point, right? Whether you're being asked questions at work or at home, right? Musa asks me all the time, deep questions I don't know the answer to. 
Today, I mean, I do know the answer to them, but I don't know how to explain them. Today he goes, who would win, Allah or King Kong? And I had to explain, right, Tawheed Lesson 101, Allah made King Kong. So, or Allah made the people that made King Kong. And so, anyways, the point being is that if someone, if it's seriously, there's a question that's being asked, and you doubt your answer, even by 1%, it's much better to pause, extract yourself, take the time to figure out the answer with somebody who's more knowledgeable, someone with more training, someone with more understanding, more fiqh, more fahim, before speaking out of line and giving that answer because you don't know. I mean, Abu Huraira literally says that I had to wait to the night time and I was able then to like find her. It took a whole day of searching. Mm. And in this day and age, if you bump into someone like in an airport or on an airplane or you say something online, like what is the, what's the guarantee you're ever going to be able to fix your wrong? Mm. I mean, luckily this woman lived in Medina, it was a village, small city. He could go and find her. But how many times have we thought about, we think about our, our, our dawah efforts and encouraging people to know about Islam and love Islam, but maybe we need to think a little bit more about the times in which we've repelled people, pushed people away by our inaccurate answers or actions that are less than Islam and think to ourselves, man, I don't know if I'm ever going to have a second chance. So it's much better out of patience and ihtiyat, caution, to seek counsel from those who know, right? I'm not one of them, but seek counsel from somebody who knows before you speak out of turn because you're not sure about the damage that is done, whether it can ever be repaired, okay? Um, and then, you know, the last thing, Shaykh, that I will mention here before we take any questions, inshallah, is just that Abu Huraira, you know, the, 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 the real powerful moment here when it comes to his tawbah is like Shaykh mentioned, and I kind of want to harp on this to finish, is his ability to own his mistake. How many of us, when we know we did something wrong, we just hope that no one ever notices? We just, we're like, okay. And he could have easily been like, it's just one lady in Medina. You know what I mean? Like, she'll figure it out or something. I don't know, she didn't seem too distraught. You go talk to your friends, like, is what I said really that bad? No, it didn't sound bad, did it? Okay, yeah, right. Maybe she heard me wrong. You start to cover up the mistake instead of just owning it, owning up to it. And then, and then one thing is, that's one thing. And then the uh, another problem, and again, this is more like a confession, like just said, you know, admitting one's own challenges. When you're kind of good with your words, then there's also the spin. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't say that. Oh, you heard me wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The spin. What I meant was because I can I can talk around anything. Yeah. Right. So I can I can get you to understand what I want you to understand. <clears throat> just name it. Yeah, exactly. Right. I can I can sell. Anything to anybody, right? So, but, um, so that's another problem. And again, this is Abu Hurairah, he's a genius. He's a genius. This man has memorized thousands and thousands and thousands of ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ. You don't think he could have talked his way around it? Mm -hmm. Even found the woman and still kind of been like, listen, you didn't ask the question properly. So I didn't give you the right answer, sure, but you also didn't ask the question properly, just so we're straight, for the record. But that's not what he's saying. Mm. That's just, it's remarkable. And the Prophet's response to him is so harsh, just like yesterday's story with Ka'b, why? Because in this scenario, if a person in, a, in, any, in any position of authority makes a mistake, you can't expect the light, you know, the light tap on the wrist, right? That, that, that a child or a rookie would get. If you're somebody who has responsibility because of the situation that Allah has put you in and you make an ill-advised mistake, don't let the consequence of that mistake make you feel all of a sudden resentful. You have to own it and you have to take it and you have to say, you know what, whatever I did, whatever I get because of what I did, I deserve it and I need to take, as they say, right, take, take it, go back to my house, lick my wounds and just hope for better days and restart soon, right? And you know what? The next morning might not feel so good. The day after, still not so good. Eventually, the sun will shine bright again. Things will be normal. The Prophet ﷺ is not going to treat Abu Huraira, you know, like a horrible, uh, 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 you know, mufti for, for the rest of his life. But there, there is a moment where if someone is genuine with you and says, what were you thinking? You can't take that statement and say, how dare you? Right? Like the gaslighting turns on. They're like, what were you thinking? You're like, what are you thinking? You have to be able to say, you're right. You're right. And that's a true characteristic of repentance. 
Repentance is not apologizing because the person felt hurt. It's apologizing because you hurt the person. It's understanding the difference, right? I'm sorry, you, I'm sorry your feelings are hurt. You went and got your feelings. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry that what I said, I'm sorry that you got feel, hurt by what I said. No, no, I'm sorry that I hurt you. And owning that is, is, is key in the repentance process. So this is Abu Huraira, right? The last night's theme was redemption. Tonight's theme is ownership. And being able to come back to the Prophet Sallallahu tell him something he didn't know, that he probably would, maybe would not have even found out about even later on, but to own that because you know that the damage that was done was something that had to be repaired before the sight of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to give us this maturity, Ameen. to give us the ability to own our mistakes. Ameen. We ask Allah Taala to give us the courage to make tawbah because it is a courageous thing. Ameen. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to make our hearts so attached to Him that when we go away from Him, we immediately turn back to Him, Ameen. and that we never ever drift too far away from Him and that we're able to follow the example of his beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Barakallahu feekum everybody. Jazakum Allah khairan. If anyone has any questions or anything, now would be a good time. Uh, we can take them, or inshallah we can begin some of the, the, the other qiyam. Yeah, Abu Bakr. Uh, Shaykh, in the initial uh, description of the narration, when you were sharing the response of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to Abu Huraira, uh, and, and the verses you mentioned, you, you also mentioned that uh, if it's not a major sin, and I wanted to ask how the situation may differ if it, if, it, if it is a major sin. Hmm. So, in general, uh, the question is that if it's not a major sin, right? Well, a person is trying to repent and it's not a major sin. So, there's two things. When it comes to repentance, seeking forgiveness of a sin or a mistake someone's committed, there are two categories, generally speaking. There is the category of, like, major sins, and then there are what we what are referred to technically as minor sins, but still, they're matters that we should take seriously. Right? For the minor sins, a general repentance, so Allah forgive me, just that much, that is sufficient. For major sins, it requires a very specific repentance. So Allah forgive me for this explicit, like this specific sin. You have to explicitly identify what you are seeking forgiveness from, as opposed to the general kind of generic seeking of forgiveness that we do. So um, the brother's asking the question that as we go through the last 10 nights, what are just some specific details about the routine, the regimen of the Prophet ﷺ during worship during these last 10 nights? Um, so there's a number of different things, and I'll ask Ustad to kind of share um, a couple of things as well. One of the things very obviously is, of course, just standing and praying, like prayer itself, the ritualistic prayer, salah, which we're going to have right now. That's something the Prophet ﷺ had you know, a good amount of during these nights as he, you know, uh, uh, revived these nights. Ahya Layl. He stayed up throughout the nights that he would, in, he would engage in prayer for quite a bit of it. Um, and then there are a few other things as well. Yeah, I, I think just in general, obviously, the, the, the engagement with dua, which we talked about during Ramadan nights on the other side, um, tasbih, mm. a lot of azkar. Azkar is seen as sort of like a passive act of worship, but it is, in fact, very active. Uh, you know, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take many shapes and forms. What we know is that when a person remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the process of purifying their heart. Mm -hmm. The heart is the organ, spiritually, which allows you to enjoy ibadah. If a heart is, is, is blemished, then the ibadah becomes burdensome. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So if the ibadah feels burdensome and weighty and difficult and dull, right, unseasoned, then it's not a problem with the ibadah, it's a problem with the heart performing it. So there's two things. Number one is performing the ibadah itself is a purification. But then on top of that, there's also other acts like adhkar and tasbih that will function as a sort of cleansing process for the heart, okay? Um, and they also have other benefits, right? So, the, you know, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Whoever regiments istighfar as part of their daily routine, that Allah Ta'ala will give them, that Allah Ta'ala will always give them a way out from bad situations, from tight spots, that Allah Ta'ala will give them relief from every grief that they experience, 
and he will provide for them in ways that they never imagined. What does this mean? Istighfar is what you do when what? You commit a sin. Why didn't the hadith, the hadith just say, whoever makes istighfar, Allah will forgive them? Because we learned that adhkar has primary benefit and then tertiary benefit. So the primary benefit is one thing, but then the hadith now is telling us there's a lot of other benefits. Okay? As a result of cleansing yourself from the sins, you're going to be able to handle situations better. You're going to be able to navigate situations better. Your inner light, your basira, your sight will be able to navigate. Your intuition will become sharper because you'll be listening to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more clearly. And you will feel the power of that rizq that you otherwise, the barakah, you didn't feel. So that's one. And then some of the scholars even mentioned that even one tasbiha on the night of Ramadan is better than 1,000 tasbihat outside of Ramadan. Hmm. So why? Because the, the value and the weight of the moment, hmm. right? So my recommendation to everybody, the Prophet Sallallahu became very, uh, you know, I don't want to say disciplined because that would imply otherwise outside, but the Prophet Sallallahu became super focused, hmm. even more so than he normally was, on having what we would call nowadays like a schedule, hmm. a worship schedule. All right, so waking up and praying, he became more generous, became obviously even greater, right? If he was already 10 out of 10, he was 11 or 12 out of 10. So see how you can apply that. What schedule can you adopt right now, tonight, that you'll keep, inshallah, for the next eight to eight to you know eight or nine nights? And don't do something that's impossible, but also don't do something that's too easy. Give yourself some challenges, inshallah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Allahu Akbar. Any sisters within Christ? Any sisters? Yeah. Okay. Good question. So was this was the second part of the passage about the one who took the life and uh, you know committed fornication? Was it revealed at that moment? Was that like a sabab of the revelation, or was it something that was already revealed? It was already revealed. And you can see that because the Prophet Sallallahu his language is very strict. He says, Aina kunta fi hadihil ayah. Mm. Like, where, <laughs> what are you thinking? Like, you know this ayah, you should know these. And then he recited to him the verses. So it was simply a, a lapse in memory, mm. right? It wasn't like he didn't know them, but it was a temporary, you know, very particular lapse in memory that Abu Huraira had. Again, maybe because of just his inability to handle the details of what happened. Right? And his struggle seeing that. I mean, he was a very pious person, dedicated his life to worship of Allah, literally lived in the masjid of the Prophet, literally, right? Like that was his, his residence from Ahl Sufa. And so you have here this sort of very, very distilled religious experience in Abu Huraira. And you have this person coming to him, asking him a question that's clearly outside of his scope for that moment. And this was his learning experience with the Prophet, right? Yeah, Allah Alam. Good question. Yeah. So it's not just about Tawbah, but having a gold standard of repentance. So my mm. question is, um, to elaborate on that, what, what is the situation of a person that might have made Tawbah, mm. but slipped along the way? Mm. The, and the second half is, I, once, I was once in a khutbah where uh, an hadith was, a hadith was given on uh, an individual who had the same complaint mm. as I can't get up to that standard. I'm not sure if I can, um, I can do justice to the the ayah because it's, mm. it's not not only about turning around, but amal wa amal amal and salah. There are a lot of repentance and Allah and that. Could you could elaborate on that. Yeah. So, brother, asking a very good question. The question is that when you look at the repentance. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَلِحًا So it seems like it's got multiple layers to it. Except for the person who believes, repents, and then reaffirms their faith. And then doesn't just do good. It says, وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَلِحًا Right? And then does a significant amount of good. So you see the layering? Right, and so 
But what's interesting here is, Ustaz was talking about this before, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, other places in the Quran, He talks about that, that Allah forgives. Mm-hmm. I forgive, Allah says, I forgive, Allah forgives the one who repents. And it's more kind of simple, straightforward. I forgive the one who repents. So from what we understand about that is, somebody just has a more simple repentance, they're still kind of figuring things out. They're not quite, like you put it very well, kind of like that gold standard of repentance, where it's not just recovery, but then you're able to recover and build on top of that. But the person is basically just able to just recover. And Allah says, I'll forgive you. So the sin is removed. What happened over here though is, if you layer on top of it, where you repent, and you grow it, reaffirm your faith, and then you start doing a significant amount of good and building on top of that, that's why Allah says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ It's not just that your sin will be removed, it's whatever amount of sin you had will be directly converted to good deeds. Mm-hmm. So if you were six feet under, you now are six feet over. You're not, you didn't just come back to ground level, you went six feet above. Right? And so that's the significance of the layering. Very good. There, there's one hadith that I'll share that I think is really beautiful. I, I came across the other day, I thought it was amazing. Shaykh, it, the hadith Ibn Abbas, he reported that the Prophet Sallallahu said that there is no such servant, there is no Muslim, that except that there is a sin that they habitually commit from time to time. He literally says, he literally describes it, أَوْ ذَنْبٌ هُوَ مُقِيمٌ عَلَيْهِ <laughs> like the sin is a resident <laughs> in your life. It won't leave, right? It doesn't even pay rent, <laughs> right? Okay, yeah. لا يفارقه حتى يفارق الدنيا. The sin will not leave the person until they die. Um, like what a description. Because a lot of us are like, wait a minute. I'm not alone? <laughs> like there's people out there like that? The Prophet Sallallahu says, yeah, everybody's like that. There's not a believing servant. Mamin abdin mu'minin. And he qualifies it, not just a servant, a servant with iman. That they struggle with this sin their entire life. Then he says, in the mu'mina khuliqa, that he says that they were created what? Muftanan. To be tested. Wa tawaban. And to repent. Nasiyan. That they will forget. <laughs> when they are reminded, they will remember. It's almost like the idea is not to be perfect, but to make sure that you can come back. Mm. But again, you don't think about this preemptively, but as if you, if you understood this hadith, like not in the future tense, but in the present tense, right? That this is part of my test, mm. and the test is not perfection, but the test is if I can be repentant. If I can be somebody that doesn't stop the process, right? Tested, repentant, forgetful. When they're reminded, they will remember. If that's a description of me, then the Prophet ﷺ is saying that I'm in a good spot, right? But I want you to understand that because sometimes in the idea of perfection, it's, 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 a, it's an inhibitor to a person's faith. If I can't be perfect, what's the point? Did Ramadan even work if I go back to the same sin after? Sure. That's a concern, and you shouldn't ever abandon that concern. Just like anyone who wants to get better should never give themselves concessions all the time. right? If you want to become better at something, you can't always make excuses for yourself. But you also at the same time have to understand the reality, which is what? Like, you do have weakness. I do have weakness. It's part of us. Thank you. And the Prophet in his words is very therapeutic, is very you know, consoling. Right? Was that a high five for water, mashallah? <laughs> right? He's averaging 10 waters a night, mashallah. Yeah, at, least, at least Mahmoud brought water. Mahmoud just ran through Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to, just to highlight on that point, there's also another narration that's beautiful about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, his conversation when the person comes to him and repents for the same sin over and over again, how he brags about that person to the angels, and this happens like three, four times. On the fourth time when the person comes back and, you know, uh, asks for forgiveness for the same sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that moment brags to the angels and all of creation, look at my servant. They came to me after sinning, came back to me. And then he says, let it be known that I've forgiven them for everything. 
And the, 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 the commentators in that hadith, they say, like, what was so unique about the fourth time? <laughs> you know, the other times were also the same process. They said that in that last time, because they kept committing the same sin and coming back, they proved that they, they were never going to let the sin stop them from Allah. Mm -hmm. That's what they proved. Like, I know who I am, but I know who Allah is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to let who I am stop me from going to Allah. And when, when you reach that state, that's what the, the, the person reached, then Allah says, you got it. You figured it out. I'm always going to be here as long as you keep coming back. Four out of four, 100%, you came back, you're going to be forgiven for everything because this is what makes you who you are. So we ask Allah Ta'ala to make us repentant. Very good. So if Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, theoretically, like as a scenario, so that we can understand some maybe situations we might find ourselves in. What if he comes, comes correct, you know, corrects what he had said, but what if the person from the other side wasn't as gracious as this woman was? What if the person from the other side says, no, well, you still gave me a bad answer and, you know, caused me a lot of distress and I don't forgive you for that. So where does that leave Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu? What's important to remember about those situations, right, and just for a moment to kind of zoom out a little bit so that we can understand how, where does this answer come from? That the Qur'an, right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the Qur'an is guidance as a whole. So parts of the Qur'an are complemented by other parts of the Qur'an. Right? That some, we have to understand these concepts by looking at the entirety of the Qur'an. Number one. Number two, Allah tells the Prophet ﷺ that the role of the Prophet ﷺ, what we call the sunnah, the prophetic tradition, is to expand and to explain what the Qur'an is saying. Right, so we have to look at the entirety, the entire corpus, the compendium of the prophetic tradition, and take all of that into consideration. And once we do that, now let's zoom back into the issue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us numerous times in the Quran, the Prophet explains it in numerous ways, that your job is to do what's in your capacity. And then you hand things off over to Allah. You do what you are capable of doing, right? You go as far as you can go. And then let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of the rest. And so in that scenario, the guidance Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala would be given by the Prophet sallallahu is, you've done your part. And now it's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah's mercy is so great that Allah could compensate the woman for the distress she suffered, that she's looking for some kind of, you know, uh, almost reprieve from, Allah could provide for her, take care of her, and at the same time, guarantee the forgiveness of Abu Hurairah That's the mercy of Allah. And that's where it's important to remember that all of these interactions, yes, we have to be merciful, we have to be forgiving, we have to do all of these things, but all of these interactions are taking place under the shade of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're all operating under the shade of the mercy of Allah. And that's the comfort that we find at the end of the day. And the, the, the one thing I'll finish with, and we have to conclude because we have our Qiyam program here, is that if you find yourself, and this is a, this is a very vulnerable space, so I'm just going to say it. We've all been wronged before. I think if we sat here and, and you know, asked for everyone to share a list of things that have been done to them, no one would have nothing to say. But remember that one of the benefits of forgiving others is you get forgiven. Mm. And so remember who you call upon. Are you always calling upon Allah for justice? Because you have to wonder if others are going to call upon Allah for justice on you. Right? <laughs> like forgiveness begets forgiveness. Now this doesn't mean that if somebody wrongs somebody that they shouldn't be held accountable. Right? Yeah. As the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says, Rahimun Allah. 
that those who have mercy, Allah Ta'ala allows His mercy to descend upon them. Irhamu man fil ard, irhamakum man fil sama. Show mercy to those on the earth, the one in the heavens will show mercy to you. So, I, uh, you know, someone that I, I respect dearly one time said, you know, check your du'as. If you're constantly seeking the Lord of justice, it's fine, but be careful, because others might be seeking that same Lord against you. But if you're constantly, be, and, and look at the Prophet Sallallahu as he's looking at the, the same kuffar from Quraysh who tried to kill him, and some of the Muslims are celebrating, you know, in certain ways, the victories of the battles. The Prophet Sallallahu of course, has moments where he's understanding the shift, but he still says this is not good. Mm. Meaning what? Them dying in this way is not good. This is not the goal. I didn't come here as a person to just massacre people. Mm. Right? Because if that was the case, the Prophet Sallallahu delivering justice to those who caused him oppression, what would Fatah Mecca have been except a bloodbath? Mm. But when he comes to these people who caused him two decades of trauma, trauma, killed his family, his friends, tortured his believers, believing followers, tortured him, were the cause of sickness in his family, pain in his life, and he says, what do you think I'm going to do? And they say, you're a, you're a generous person, the son of a generous person. He says, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. There's, there's no blame on you today. That is the example of someone who understands that forgiveness and mercy begets more mercy. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us means of mercy for others and that that will be a means for mercy for us. Ameen, ameen, ya rabbil alameen. Barakallahu feekum everybody, inshaAllah. We'll see you here tomorrow, uh, hopefully, uh, for the next uh, you know, uh, installment in our series, inshaAllah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.